Hey everybody, this is Rishi Agarwal, and in this video I wanted to talk about pulmonary nodules. This video is going to be a little bit different from my usual videos because this one is not aimed at medical professionals but at patients. I've been getting a lot of questions through this channel about pulmonary nodules, and so in this video I'm going to try to explain what a pulmonary nodule is and what it means if you have one. Let me just begin by saying that this video is for educational purposes and not meant to replace medical advice in any way. Each patient is different, and if you have further questions, you should direct them to your own medical professionals. I just want to repeat that again. This is a very sort of top-level, general type of talk, and if you want to know what to do about your specific situation, it's better if you talk to your own medical professional who knows all about your medical history. Let's start out by defining what a pulmonary nodule is, and for this I'm going to turn to this paper which is put out by the Fleischner Society, which is just a group of experts in the field, and they put out a glossary of terms for thoracic imaging so that all of us in the field would be using the same terminology. Now the definition in this glossary of terms goes into a little bit more detail than what I'm showing here, but this is the main part of the definition. On CT scans, a nodule appears as a round or irregular opacity, well or poorly defined, measuring up to 3 centimeters in diameter. Now I want to go into each part of this definition, so let's start with this, the CT scan. A CT scan, by the way, is the same thing as a CAT scan, but most people in the medical field use the term CT scan. Now back in the day, as recent as like 25 or 30 years ago, before CT was very common, if a doctor told you that you have a lung nodule or a spot in the lung, or sometimes they called it a coin lesion, they were referring to an x-ray. Now the difference today is that most nodules that are detected by medical imaging are detected by CT scans. And the reason why that's important is that for us to see a nodule on x-ray means that the nodule has to be about 10 millimeters or 1 centimeter in size. Now we can see smaller nodules from time to time on x-rays, but it's harder. And it's much harder to see really small nodules like 1 or 2 or 3 millimeters that we routinely see on CT. And the reason is that an x-ray is a single picture of the chest from front to back with everything overlapping, so that if there were a nodule behind a bone, or behind a big blood vessel, or behind the heart, or the diaphragm, those nodules could be hidden by those structures. A CT scan is different because it's not a single image, but multiple images. Imagine taking a cucumber and slicing it up into discs. That's how we analyze a CT scan. Each disc we call a slice. And a slice can be very thin, even less than a millimeter. But usually we analyze the images at between 1 to 3 millimeter slices. The benefit of the slices is that we don't have the problem of having nodules hiding behind normal structures. And this allows us to see really small nodules. The other trend with CTs is that we're doing a lot more of them than we used to in the 90s and early 2000s. This is an article that was published in 2015 entitled Recent Trends in the Identification of Incidental Pulmonary Nodules. These researchers looked at seven years of data going from 2006 to 2012, and they looked at 4.6 million adult patients. This was in the Southern California area. Of those, about 218,000 had at least one chest CT during that time frame, and of those patients, almost a third had a lung nodule. And in this study, they defined a nodule as being 4 millimeters or greater. And so I would imagine that if they defined a lung nodule as being 1 millimeter or greater, this number would be closer to 75 or 80 percent. The point I'm trying to make with this slide is that lung nodules, especially with modern CT scanners, are very, very common. Let's go back to our definition and define the rest of these terms. It says a nodule appears as a rounded or irregular opacity. So all that refers to is the shape of the nodule. So a nodule can be round or circular like this, or it can be irregular like this. 
both of these are considered nodules. And by the way, an opacity in this context just means a focal area of increased lung density. The next part of this term talks about well or poorly defined, and that refers to the margins or the borders of the nodule. So this is a nodule with well-defined margins, meaning I could take a pencil and outline the margins of this nodule very easily, whereas in this one, the borders of the nodule are very fuzzy. So this is what would be called poorly defined. Both of these still are considered nodules. And the final part of this definition is that it measures up to three centimeters in diameter. If a nodule measures three centimeters or greater, we stop calling it a nodule and instead we use the term mass. So just to give you an idea of how big three centimeters is, a quarter is two and a half centimeters in diameter. A penny is about two centimeters. This is a chocolate chip, it's about one centimeter. This is a lentil, which is about half a centimeter or five millimeters. And this is a mustard seed, which is about one millimeter. And finally, I just wanna add one additional term, which is the density or attenuation of the nodule. So a solid nodule, you can think of a solid nodule as like a blackout curtain where it totally blocks out the sunlight and you don't see any light coming through. A solid nodule is sort of like that in that it completely obscures the underlying lung architecture. Whereas a subsolid nodule you can think of as like translucent shades where it lets some light through. In this example, this subsolid nodule, you could still sort of see the underlying lung architecture. Okay, so that's the definition of a lung nodule, but what does it mean if you have a nodule? One of the main reasons why we care about lung nodules is that a small percentage of them turn out to be lung cancer. But when they're small, like less than a centimeter, how do you know which ones are gonna be cancer and which ones are gonna be benign? And how do you manage all these nodules that you're seeing on CT? This is a set of guidelines that was put forth by the Fleischner Society in 2017, and it's for the management of incidental pulmonary nodules detected on CT. And that term incidental is important. And all that means is that the nodule doesn't have to do with the reason for getting the study in the first place. So for example, let's say that you had COVID and you still have symptoms and it was six months ago. So your doctor gets a CT scan to look for lung scarring. And the CT scan doesn't show lung scarring, but it shows that you have a nodule. That nodule would be considered an incidental finding. Okay, so let's talk about for a second who these guidelines are not meant for. They're not meant for patients with known cancer, okay, because a patient with known cancer and a lung nodule, that is not an incidental finding because that lung nodule could mean that the patient has metastatic disease. They're not meant for patients who are less than 35 years old because patients who are less than 35 years old, lung cancer is very uncommon. So if you have a lung nodule and you're less than 35, it's probably infectious or inflammatory in etiology, and the follow-up should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not meant for patients who are immunocompromised or have a weakened immune system for any reason. And the reason is patients who are immunocompromised have an increased risk of having infections compared to the general population. And so a lung nodule may be a sign of infection in this patient group. And then finally, heavy smokers, or specifically patients who are enrolled in lung cancer screening, these guidelines don't apply. And there's a whole different set of guidelines for patients enrolled in lung cancer screening that are different from these Fleischner Society guidelines. These guidelines are divided up into solid nodules and subsolid nodules, and also low-risk patients and high-risk patients. A low-risk patient is someone who is a non-smoker and has no family history of lung cancer. The follow-up of these nodules is based on the size of the nodule, 
And that's because as the size of the nodule increases, the greater the chance that the nodule represents lung cancer. So if you look at this first column over here, no follow-up is recommended in a low-risk patient with small nodules, less than six millimeters, meaning five millimeters or less. We know that even in heavy smokers, the chance that a small nodule less than six millimeters is lung cancer is very slim, like less than 1%. And so in a low-risk patient, in a non-smoker, that chance is even less. So that's why we don't recommend follow-up for low-risk patients with small lung nodules. So if these nodules don't represent lung cancer, then what are they? A lung nodule could represent hundreds of different things, and this is just a short selected list that I pared down from this textbook, Mueller's Imaging of the Chest. And in the area of the country where I live, which is Chicago, a lung nodule is frequently due to fungal infection, actually. And there's something called endemic infections. And that word endemic just means that it's common in certain geographic areas. So in the Midwest, histoplasmosis and blastomycosis are two very common endemic fungal infections. Histo, in particular, can infect patients with normal immune systems, and the body just fights it off and the patient may not even know that he or she has been infected with the fungus. And after it's been fought off and the infection clears, all that's left after the infection goes away is a little nodule, and that's called a granuloma. So in other parts of the country, other fungal infections are more common, and in other parts of the world, TB is still very common. And for TB, even after you've been fully treated, with antibiotics, you'll probably have some pulmonary nodules left over. And then beyond infections, you can have congenital causes like cysts or something called AVMs, arteriovenous malformations. Um, you can have inflammatory things like, for example, patients with rheumatoid can occasionally have pulmonary nodules. Sarcoid is another common cause for lung nodules, but there's many, many more. So let's take a look at the nodules that are a little bit bigger. So six to eight millimeter nodules, follow-up is recommended in low-risk patients at six to 12 months or three to six months, depending on whether they are single or multiple. And then after that, it's up to the discretion of the patient and doctors whether or not to continue following the nodules. Um, usually, they're only followed one more time at 18 to 24 months, and then after that, they're not really followed because if we've shown that after two years, a nodule hasn't grown, that's sufficient evidence for us to say that the nodules are benign. And then if the nodules are greater than eight millimeters, the chances of lung cancer go up slightly, but still less than around 3%. So the follow-up is based on the imaging characteristics and other factors. For example, if it's eight millimeters, but it still looks benign, then the radiologist might recommend a follow-up at three months. If it's eight millimeters but it looks malignant, then the radiologist might recommend a PET-CT, which is a type of imaging study used for cancer, or they might recommend a tissue sampling, which is a biopsy where a needle is inserted into the nodule and a little bit of tissue is taken out and it's put under a microscope where a pathologist looks at it and can tell whether or not it's lung cancer, or something else. For patients that are high risk, which means smokers but not enrolled in lung cancer screening, or if they have a family history of lung cancer, then the follow-up is a little different. This high risk category also includes high risk nodules, and what I mean by that is that sometimes there are characteristics of the nodule that might make a radiologist more suspicious for cancer. Like, for example, if the nodule has irregular or what we call spiculated borders, then that goes into this high risk patient category. Now, the follow up intervals are similar to the low-risk patients, but the recommendations are a little more firm. So for example, in the small nodule group, low-risk patients, no follow-up was recommended, but in this high-risk group, follow-up is optional at 12 months. And then for this six to eight millimeter category, a CT is recommended at six to 12 months, just like the low-risk group, but then in this high-risk group, this 
second follow-up at 18 to 24 months is recommended rather than optional. And then the same thing for the multiple nodules. The three to six month follow-up is the same as the low risk group, but this 18 to 24 month follow-up is recommended rather than being optional. And then finally, the recommendations for subsolid nodules are different than solid nodules. Okay, and first of all, there's no division between low risk and high risk groups. It's all one big category. And subsolid nodules are treated differently because if you have a lung cancer that's subsolid, then those cancers tend to grow very slowly. So for a solid nodule, we're usually satisfied if it's stable for two years. We say that's enough evidence for us that this nodule is benign. But for a subsolid nodule, two years is not enough time for us to say that a nodule is benign because the nodule could grow on year three or on year four, okay? So that's why we recommend at least five years of follow-up for subsolid nodules, and it might be more depending on the size and other features of the nodule, okay? And I'm not gonna go into every detail about subsolid nodules, but the take-home point for subsolid nodules is that if you have one, you will probably need follow-up for more than two years, and it might be at least five years for us to say whether or not something is benign. So that basically covers the guidelines for the management of incidental pulmonary nodules. So I hope you've learned something from this talk, and I just want to summarize my main points here. The first is that lung nodules are very common. Because we're doing so many CT scans and the CT scans are very, very detailed, we're seeing nodules as small as one millimeter. Now, that doesn't mean that every nodule needs to be followed up. In fact, in low-risk patients, most small nodules don't require any follow-up, and they're usually due to benign things like granulomas. Now, size is an important factor in determining follow-up, and the bigger the nodule is, the more important it is for you to get a follow-up exam to make sure that it doesn't grow. And then finally, the Fleischner guidelines are a good starting point for you to have a discussion with your medical provider about when to follow up your nodule, but if you have a relevant medical history, the follow-up of the nodule should be tailored to your specific risk factors and preferences. Okay, thanks very much.